Welcome back, friends. You're listening to Choose, Sip, Repeat. I'm your host, Christina Winkle. Today's guest is Gregory Leon, who was just recently nominated for a James Beard Award for Outstanding Chef. On this episode, we chat about his career as a chef and what it's like being nominated for his third James Beard Award. A friend of mine who I've known for a long time, um, Mr. or Chef Gregory, Gregory Leon. Although I always call you just Greg, not Gregory. That's fine. But I, Greg but I feel fine. like I feel like everything that I've seen of you lately, it's been Gregory, because I've done some little stalking. So is that what you're going by recently? Either or is fine. No, either or is fine. I think that when they write stuff about the restaurant, they use a the full name just to be, I don't know, fancier. But Greg is totally fine. <laughs> Um, so Greg is uh, Tulsa born, but grew up the majority of your childhood in Venezuela, correct? Correct. Um, and then you moved back to the States and started your culinary career for the more or less in San Francisco. And then um, I know you because we worked together at the chalkboard, which is obviously here in Tulsa. 94, I moved to San Francisco to start my culinary career. And it was there for 18 years, the 12 of 18 years. But during those 18 years, especially after my grandfather died, I would go back to Oklahoma and spend like big chunks of time there to spend time with my family. So that's where I met the owner of the chalkboard in one of those trips. And then I met you and everybody else in that group. Okay. That was, I was curious as how you started at the chalkboard. Um, like, was it by coincidence or, or just. So remember he opened that other restaurant, the wine place. Yeah, 55 degrees. Yeah. So when I met with him, he was like, oh, I'm opening this new place. I'm looking for somebody who can help me get it off the ground. I was like, perfect. I'm going to be here anyway, so let's do this. Um, But then he was like, it's not going to be ready for a while. So I'm going to put you in the chalkboard and not really. And he was like, I'm not going to tell people what you're doing here, but maybe you can help me get the chalkboard in order. So it was kind of a weird situation. Um, Yeah, that would be a very... As he didn't really <laughs> tell anybody what I was doing there. Everybody just assumed that I was just this new cook. So whenever I would tell the cooks, hey, how about we do it this way or that way? They'd be like, well, who are you and why are you telling us what to do? So um, it was, you know, I feel like any job can be a learning experience. And that whole episode at the chalkboard of the NFF was, was certainly a learning experience. I'd never opened a restaurant from the ground up. Like literally he picked me up oh. at the airport and took me to see the parcel of land where it was going to be built. So it was really interesting. And I met some good people like you. So, you know, good things yeah. came out of it. Yeah, it was not a, it, it was, it, while it's a, maybe some growing pains and learning curves, it was not all for naught. We, no, we, not at all. Yeah, and you now reside in Milwaukee. Oh yes, I, again, was in San Francisco for a total of 18 years and in 2012, I was just like, it's too expensive. I'm 42, I've got nine roommates. I just, I don't, this is not for me. <laughs> um, and for a long time, I kept thinking that if I left San Francisco and didn't open a restaurant there, then I'd be a failure as a chef. And I went to eat dinner with a friend of mine and she says, well, maybe the plan was for you to come here and learn all this stuff and take it someplace else. So my dog and I traveled the US about half of 2012 um, and we went to different cities where I knew people and where I knew there was a culinary community and scene. And Milwaukee was not on my radar. And at the end of August, I was just back in Oklahoma visiting my brothers. I was going to go to San Francisco and then go to Portland. I decided to move to Portland. And a really good friend of mine lives in Milwaukee. And he's like, you should come visit Milwaukee. And honestly, I had no idea where it was. Like, I looked it up at a map and I was like, oh, that looks really far north. It's probably really cold. And he yeah. just, like, hammered me for about a week. And I was like, fine, I'll come check it out for a few days. And I was presently surprised. I came at the end of August. It was beautiful. We're right by Lake Michigan. It is actually a very beautiful city. Um, and I went and ate about at about four or five restaurants. And it was the, the scene just blew me away. And I decided to stay. That's such a great story. And I am kicking myself so much because we were just in Chicago no um, this, this past summer. And I told Trey, I was like, let's go see Greg and see his restaurant. But then when we were looking at logistics and everything, because we were staying, the main destination was to stay in a cabin in Michigan. Okay. So to go up there and then go all the way back around the lake, it was just kind of, but yeah. now now I wish I would have made that a little bit more of a priority. Well, next time, next time. Yes, 
I will. So um, let's talk about the fact that, or I just want to make an announcement right now. We'll get into it later. But you were just nominated for uh, James Beard Award and not not just best chef in Midwest, but like best chef in the United States. That is awesome. And I just want to say congratulations. And I'm very proud of you. Thank you. That's so awesome. Thank you. let's, Let's go ahead and get in and talk about, you know, the the formality of the show. Um, I try to keep it go the same way, just so listeners kind of understand how it works and, and know what's coming next kind of situation. But, um, so at the end of every episode, we end it with where uh, the guest of that show asks the next guest on the show a question, but they don't know who the guest will be. So it's kind of very like a mystery question, a little bit of an icebreaker kind of situation. Um, and last week's guest question was, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a complicated one, but it is what myth since working in the industry, have you learned not to be true? What myth? Mm, Let me think about this for a second. What myth? So like the best one I can think of as an example would be like, or the easiest one would be so many people just assume that you take red wine and it you just drink it at room temperature, which can be happen. It's not going to be the worst thing that has ever happened. It's not bad or anything like that. But a lot of professionals will recommend that you chill it for a little slightly before serving it. So that would be like a myth that you I got learned. one. I got one. So okay. the one that I that everybody has always talked about and that I find not to always be true, and I'm glad, especially at Amalinda, which is the the, the name of the restaurant, is that there's always this um, fight or division between the front of the house and the back of the house. You know, you hear that a lot. I've experienced it at other restaurants. Um, We don't have that at at my place. I love that. It's so funny that you talk about that because Um, One of the previous uh, guests I had on was uh, Tony Collins and he and I, the main topic of the conversation was talking about champagne um, and just kind of how the the innards and and what's changing in that world. But we did spend a decent amount of time talking about the the division of front of the house and the back of the house. So that's really uh, I think it's it speaks volume like that in a in, in a nutshell says a lot about your restaurant. Right there. Well, we, have a, the... we have a very small staff. There's only seven of us, including myself. Okay. Um, and so, and we're there. It's the same people every day. You know, when you have a bigger restaurant with a bigger staff, you know, some days you have certain servers, some days you have certain cooks. At Amalinda, it's the same people every day. So uh, I'm very lucky that everybody gets along. And, and, you know, busy service. I'm grumbling about the servers. Where's the food runner? But at the end of the day, we all get along and uh, we're there for a purpose and we will all work very hard and and, and they're a great team. They work very hard and they treat the establishment as if it was theirs. That's awesome. You've um, obviously created a very good culture there. So So that's that's really- I would like to think so. Yeah. I I mean, I think that what you just said says that. So that's really great. Um, so let's get to know you a little bit better. Um, for those of you, I mean, you and I have a history because of like, we just discussed you, your, your short stints here and there through Oklahoma. Um, but some people, most, I would imagine the majority of the listeners that listen to this podcast might not be familiar with you because, um, whilst you've been in, um, you know, the culinary scene for a really, really long time, most of it has not been here in Tulsa. And and that currently is the most of our listener. So, um, we've already covered that you were born in Tulsa, but how old were you mo- when you moved to Venezuela? Uh, when I moved to Venezuela, I was five, and I lived there till I was 19. Oh, okay. And then at 19, I moved, my whole family and I moved back to Oklahoma. We moved back to Oklahoma because that's where my grandparents were, and my mother wanted to be close to her parents. Um, and then in 1994, I hopped on a bus and went out to San Francisco. Yes. And um, so that's when you moved back to the States. Where was your first industry job? Uh, I'm assuming San Francisco. Well, I waited tables in Tulsa before I went to San Francisco. Oh, where? Mm, I TGI Fridays of all places. <laughs> it's okay. I worked at Golden Corral when I first met. Oh, oh, there you go. <laughs> but, uh, but I don't know if I would count that as like, you know, my first real industry job. You know, it wasn't right. the industry, but it wasn't really what I wanted to do. My first kitchen job was at this 
restaurant called Zuni Cafe in San Francisco. Uh -huh. um, and I, when I went to San Francisco, I had no, I'd never worked in the kitchen. I had no experience whatsoever. And I figured I'll just figure it out. I was like, oh, so I didn't know anything about the food scene in San Francisco. And again, 1994, there was Food Network, I think it had been on for maybe about a year. There weren't a lot of celebrity chefs. You know, when you would tell people I want to be a chef, they would look at you and like, for what? Why? What are you going to do? It's not like now where you're like, oh, I want to be a chef. And people are like, oh, that's awesome. You know, like there was right. no cachet. There was no cachet in being a chef or restaurant owner. Um, so I knew nothing about the San Francisco food scene. And the reason I went there was because I had had lunch with a friend of mine. And he's like, if you're really serious about becoming a chef, you need to get out of Oklahoma. You need to either go to New York or San Francisco, because at the time, those were like the culinary hubs of the country. Yeah. Um, so I was like, I'll go to San Francisco. It's California. It's going to be warm. Um, and it was not. San Francisco was cold and rainy the day I got there. Uh, but I walked by this building that I thought was really pretty. And I went in and I was like, are you looking for help? And they said, yeah. So I filled out the application. I lied on the application. Um, <laughs> and said I had like more experience than I did. And that lasted for about three months. And Marsha McBride at the time was the kitchen manager. And she was very nice. She took me to her office. She's like, you know, you're trying really hard, but you're horrible at this. So <laughs> you know, she basically was like, I, I can't have you screwing up our stuff at the restaurant. I let her learn that what Zuni was and, and it's a restaurant that had been around, I think, since either the 70s or the 80s. I don't really, I think it's the 80s. Um, and it's it was an establishment. So um, that putting that on the next application, I at least got chefs to speak to me. And then I was honest and open with them. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. This is what I want to do. And my plan was to go there, make some money and go to school. But after two years, um, I just never went to school and I just kind of learned on the job. I was very lucky that some chefs were willing to take me under their wing and teach me and be very patient with me. Um, but this year, 2024, will mark my 30th year working in kitchen. So Wow. And I say that out loud and it makes you feel really old. But <laughs> That is a milestone and a benchmark that you should be proud of. I mean, like you've accomplished a lot in your career and that's great. Um, so tell me a little bit more about your restaurant. And I'm, I'm afraid to say the name because I don't want to mispronounce it. So tell me again how to say it. The name of the restaurant is called Amilinda. 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 And it is a combination of my parents' name. So my mother, who was from the U.S., her name was Linda. And my father, who's from Venezuela, his name is Amilcar, which is a very traditional Venezuelan name. Um, and so we combined those two names for the name of the restaurant. Um, it also means to my beautiful. And also in Venezuela, houses have names, not numbers. So this was the name of the home my brothers and I grew up in. Oh, so wow. there's some meaning and, you know, I, I did it to pay homage to my parents who, you know, my dad's been super supportive through my whole career in the kitchen and um, my love of food and really came from my parents and from you know them cooking for us all the time and having a big family and people coming over on the weekends so i figured it was it was a fitting name yes that's very sweet and what kind of um cuisine do you do at the restaurant so we specialize or we're inspired by the cuisine of the iberian peninsula so both spain and portugal oh okay so we don't do tradition like we don't do tapas we don't do paella um you know when we opened my opinion was that most American diners, when you said Spanish food, they're like, oh, paella and tapas. And I'm like, yes, but there's more to it. So our goal was to show, case all the other amazing things that they eat there. So we'll take traditional recipes and adapt them to um, what we can get here, maybe to our own personal tastes. We tweak them a little bit. Um, and, you know, we try to work with as many local farmers as possible. It gets a little difficult in the winter, mm -hmm. um, but spring, spring, summer, and fall are amazing here in Wisconsin because we've got some really great, great, great farmers. And I have one farmer that I've been working with since the restaurant was actually a pop up. So before we opened where we are now, which we will celebrate nine years in August, from December of 2013 to January of 2015, we were a pop up restaurant. And for oh, those wow. of you, yeah. So we would pop up at the National Cafe every Saturday night. We did that for about a year. Yeah. I mean, I've seen a lot of people do that, but I haven't seen a lot of people do that um, successfully for that long of a period. So what was that like? How was the pop-up? I mean, you did that for two years. 
about, about a year, a year and a month or so. Um, it was great. You know, I did, I did most of the prep and cooking in my house. <laughs> then we would take it to the restaurant. Um, you know, it was a chance for me to like work on dishes, uh, create a relationship with purveyors, like the meat company that I use and the fish, fish company that I use along with this farmer. I've been using them since then. So we have a very long history. Um, it was a way for me to introduce myself to the Milwaukee culinary scene and uh, the food writers of Milwaukee. And um, something that at the time I didn't think about it, but then I realized that once we opened where we are now was, you know, when you open a restaurant in the location, you open the door and you're like, okay, and now I need people to come in and get to know us and, and figure out what we do. By the time we opened where we are now, we already had a customer base. Yeah. People already, people already knew our food. They already knew me. Articles had been written about us. So that kind of made the opening a little bit easier. Um, sometimes I miss the pop-up days because there was a <laughs> lot, there was a lot less, um, what do you call it, uh, stress and a lot less responsibility. And the menu was super small. Um, yeah. But but then I, I think about all those nights when we had to like pack everything up on Saturday night after feeding 30 people and then taking it back to the house and washing it. So, you know, one or the other. Right. So would you, earlier you mentioned that your parents did a lot of the cooking for you and kind of that made an impression on you and potentially um, drove you into the industry. So would you say that they are the ones who truly inspired you to cook or is there another? I would say... They, I don't know if they inspired me to cook, but they ins they showed me that food and cooking can be something to show how much you love people. And it can also be a vehicle to make somebody's life a little bit better, even for those 30, 40 minutes, hour and a half where they're eating. Um, yeah. that's, I, I, I think that's what they did. Yeah, that's really sweet. I love that so much. I, I you know, when I ask people that question, I always... I mean, I don't know necessarily if I want my daughters to enter the industry. I, and not that I have anything ag against them doing it, but I don't, I want them to just do. Yeah, it's a tough life. Yeah, and I just want them to do whatever, like, makes them happy, ultimately. Um, but I do wonder, you know, if they were to sit where you are now and someone asked them that question, like, what their answer will be. And um, I don't know. I think it's a really great question to learn more about that particular person in their 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 um path that they chose and why and i the way that you answered you can tell that you are really passionate about about food and food is your love language and it's the way that you show your your care and it's Thank awesome. you. i can't i can't imagine doing anything else i mean and there's days when i get home and i'm like oh i just want to lock that place down and burn it to the ground um, <laughs> But at the end of the day, I also realize it's my restaurant. It's busy. It's very well regarded. You know, it's Milwaukee has been amazing to us. Um, so I'm so grateful for it, even though there's days when I'm just like, oh, my God, I, I just want to run away from this place. Um, <laughs> you know, I have a friend from junior high who I still speak to. And he swears that when I was like 15, I told him I wanted to be a chef. I don't really remember that. Uh, but he I mean, and he's the kind of person that would have made something up. So I believe him when he tells me this story but and then i'm impressed that he remembers a conversation we had when we were 14. right 40 I, years ago i have a similar story my mother uh one time in her um attempt to teach me how to cook when i was a teenager and i had zero desire to do it she was trying to teach me how to make fried okra and she was like come in come in the kitchen like i'm going to teach you how to cook and I looked at her and I said, I don't need to learn how to cook. I'm going to marry a chef. <laughs> <laughs> and look at you. And I did. You married a chef. Yeah. That, now, I do have a quick question for you. Does he cook a lot at home? Yes, a lot. He's a rarity because yeah. I, I don't even remember when was the last time I cooked at home. Really? Um, and a lot of my chef friends here in Milwaukee, we talk about it. And we're like, yeah, I don't. Like, I will come home. If I don't eat dinner at the restaurant before I leave, my sous chef is really good about like making sure I eat something before I leave. But if it's just super hectic, or I'm just like, I'm not hungry. It's a bowl of cereal or like a sandwich. Yeah. Well, every, think... every once in a while on a Monday, which so we're close Sunday, Mondays and Tuesdays. Every once in a while on a Monday, I was like, I'm going to make some Italian food, but it's a rarity. So he's a gem. You hold on to that man. <laughs> I have no desire to let him go, but, um, I think a lot of it probably has to do like I, I was talking about this to a friend the other day. A lot of it, the fact that he and I, well, I, I cook, too, but 
Um, we probably, he probably cooks probably, I would say 65 to 75% of the time. And then I just plug in the days when he's like, you can tell he really doesn't. I also, also have kids too, which you need to feed, you know, I, right. I have That's, two dogs. Yeah. Yeah. I you can just food. open up a can or a can or yeah. Here's yeah. Your dry food. Yeah. So the kids really are what is the driving factor there because before we had children, he and I were going out all the time and visiting our friends at restaurants and all of that. But the kids, they, it, it, they have to be fed, you know, <laughs> it's a requirement <laughs> and it's expensive to go out for a family of five, every, you know, meal. So you have to cook at home. Yeah. So it's, that's the big thing probably. And I, he hasn't been cooking as long as you have. So I think it's still, um, so fresh and exciting for him. Yeah, especially when he's exploring new um, genres or a new ingredient or a new technique or something like that, then it's he kind of starts, you know, thinking about a lot more um, and wants to do it out at home as well. So, yeah, it's a little bit different. Um, yeah, he's pretty great. Um, what I'm you mentioned earlier with um, the restaurant being closed Sunday is you said Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. Yeah. So prior to the pandemic, we were only closed Sundays and Mondays. And then, you know, with that thing that happened in 2020, um, when we reopened, when we were allowed to reopen, we were only open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And right. then I think at the beginning of last year, was it, or maybe it was the year before last Wait, this, No, the year yeah, at the beginning of 2022, I think we decided to open on Wednesdays. And so now we're open Wednesdays through Saturdays. Um, I'm not sure we'll ever open on m m Tuesdays, sorry, on Tuesdays again. Um, you know, my staff likes having three days off. I like having three days off. Um, we use those days, Mondays and Tuesdays, to do like special events, um, yeah. private parties and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm also downtown. Um, and, you know, downtown Milwaukee, although it is vibrant and has lots of restaurants, you know, Mondays and Tuesdays, it's a little bit of a ghost town. And a lot of people haven't come back to the office yet. So uh, Tuesdays, the majority of our business was also business travelers. And that's not really come back yet. So we'll probably stay the way we are. Yeah, I, the, Tulsa is kind of struggling with a similar thing of the downtown um, population not coming back to work. A lot of them still working from home. So a lot, especially a lot of the day lunch restaurants are really struggling. So do you only open for dinner or you do lunch and? Only dinner. Okay. We're actually in about two weeks, we're about to launch like this kind of hybrid lunch situation on Thursdays and Fridays, but it's only gonna be to go and it's a very limited menu. Um, just to see how that goes. We were about to open for lunch uh, when the pandemic hit, which I fought the nail. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. And at the time I had a business partner um, and he's like, oh no, we have to do this. And I was like, fine. Um, and then the pandemic hit and I just like, I, I don't think I'll ever open for lunch, like sit down service where people will come in and we'll do this. We're going to try out this to go thing for a couple of weeks and see how it goes. I was always told that if you can get a restaurant to be successful, to a lunch shift to be successful where it pays for like everything within the restaurant, then that is like the ultimate sign of success. So yeah, that would be fantastic. I just, you know, the other thing is again, August 1st will be our ninth anniversary. So I don't think at this point people expect us to be open for lunch. And obviously they're not thinking about us when they're like, let's go eat lunch because we've never served lunch. So I don't, I'm fine not doing lunch. I'm okay with that. You're okay and with that. Also, it. also, you know, it, so right now our kitchen staff since the pandemic is just my sous chef and I. So we do everything. We have a menu that fluctuates between 10 and 12 items, uh, plus usually two desserts. Um, and so him and I do everything. And so we, he gets there around nine in the morning. I roll in around 10. And then we, from that moment on until about four, we're prepping and getting everything ready for dinner. Right. Um, so I don't, and we have a very small kitchen too. So I don't, I just don't see how it would work. I think it would be more irritating than anything. Well, yeah. And then you're, you're talking about adding more staff and then your, your overhead grows and you're hoping that your, your lunch is going to cover the new people that I just hired. So we're good. Right. We're good. Yeah, I think if it's working for you, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Right, you know, nine years, so I think it's <laughs> working for us.
I think it's working really well, especially with the the latest uh, nomination and everything. I think you're I think you're doing okay. I think we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I ha- my next question that I have for you is: Is there any? Um, you've been open for nine years. Is there a restaurant, a chef, a restaurant tour, um, anybody in particular in the industry that you kind of have your eye on, maybe you use as inspiration or um, maybe even a little healthy competition or anything like that? The two chefs that come to mind when I, when I think about, like, I really like how they work and their philosophy on food is uh, Nancy Silverton, who is in L.A., um, and I've been following her most of my career. She now has three places in LA. One of them is called Osteria Moza. And I like her philosophy with food, where again, she takes Italian dishes and kind of tweaks them to her palate and to what she can get from the local farmers. And then I like um, Alain Passard, who is the chef of this restaurant in Paris. And the name of the restaurant is escaping me right now. Um, it'll come to me in a second. So his whole philosophy is, he doesn't write anything down. And he says, I never want to make the same dish, this, the same dish twice. And in interviews, his cooks have said he'll change dishes from one table to another or from wow. one service to another. And I was very fortunate in 2016. I was out. The name of the restaurant is Arpege. And if people are interested in finding out more about him and Nancy Silverton, um, they're both on that series called Chef's Table. Yeah. Really, okay. Yeah. They're both on that series. So in 2016, 16, I think it was, I was very lucky and fortunate to be able to go eat at Alain Passard's restaurant in Paris. And it was an incredible experience. Um, but yeah, he, I like, we, we don't write a lot of things down. We have certain recipes that, that we make sure we follow and we use. And there's certain dishes that we make always the same because they become staples of Amelinda. Right. But, especially with fish dishes. It's like, okay, this is the fish I have to work with today. What do I want to put with it? And I think some people get frustrated because they'll come in and like, oh my God, I was here last year and I had that amazing sea bass and it had this and this and this, make it again. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, I have no <laughs> clue because we don't write stuff down. So, right. you know, when we, and, and our menu also changes a lot. So as I said, we have a very small menu and sometimes our menu will change from one week to another, from one day to another not the whole menu. We've tried that a couple of times and we've learned that putting five new dishes on the menu at once is probably the limit for us just because it's a lot. Um, but, you know, we'll keep a dish on for a couple of weeks. If people really like it, then maybe we'll keep it on for a couple more weeks. You know, sometimes we'll keep something on for about a month and a half. It depends on how bored I get with it. Um, it depends on, you know, whether or not we can continue to get the produce that we're using for the dish. Um, and, and again, when we first opened that, people would get really frustrated. They're like, I was here last week and the menu is completely different. I wanted what I had last week. So we kind of had to, and I hate to word, use the word train because it makes it sound like they're dogs, but we had to educate our diners that, no, this is kind of what we do here and we like to keep it and we like to change things. And, you know, I, one of the main decisions for doing that was I remember when I was line cooking, I was working for somebody else and you go into the restaurant and you're doing the same thing every day. You kind of become a robot. And then you're not really paying attention to what you're doing. I feel this way you keep people interested and engaged um, along with the diners. Um, the other thing we do with our menu is that I want input from my sous chef. Um, and uh, right now I have this amazing young man named Trevor Carper, who is just an incredible, incredible sous chef. He's got such a good palate and he's so committed to the restaurant. And he just comes in every day and he's just so excited. Um, and uh, so I, I come to him and I was like, okay, I need a new steak dish. We need a new vegetarian. Um, let's take the lamb off and put some other kind of protein. So get me some stuff. And he'll come to me and then we'll talk about it. Before he came down, Melinda, he didn't have a lot of experience with Spanish or Portuguese food. Now he's gotten a lot better. He's been there for about a year now. Um, but, you know, we'll tweak it a little bit. I'll be like, oh, these ingredients are screened to be Asian. So how about we change it to this? Uh, but yeah, I want people to feel some sort of ownership with the menu also. So I, I want some input. I don't know everything. And I don't think I have the brain capacity to constantly come up with like 12 dishes every week. So I appreciate the help. 
Well, and I imagine he, you know, with with his new the new energy that he's bringing to the table and how um, committed he is to the restaurant and his um, enthusiasm probably, you know, rubs off on you. And it's a give and take kind of relationship. Yeah, 100 yeah. percent. Like, you know, he'll text me sometimes at like one or two in the morning. And I was like, dude, go get some rest. Like, <laughs> I like the idea. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Go to sleep. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's very, he's very excited about everything. And he, he's, I'm very excited to see where his career will go because he's going to be a shining star. That's awesome. I love that you're speaking so um, proudly of him. Uh, I feel like a lot of chefs slash mentors, um, executive chefs specifically, don't particularly hearken back and, and give pay homage to the ones that are helping them push on that pedestal. So, yeah, you know, I make sure, you know, I try to talk as many tables as I can every night. And, you know, the tables will be like, oh my God, the food's so great. We love this place. And I always make sure to say, this is a group effort. I don't do everything in this restaurant. I can't. It's physically impossible. So I want to make sure that the people that are working in that restaurant are getting the praise that they deserve. And I'll have other chefs tell me, he's like, you know, I hear you when they'll be like, oh, I love X, Y, Z dish. Like you'll go to a table and they'll be like, oh, I really like this dish. You will say, oh, I will let the sous chef know because he made it. He's like, you know, we're I'll have chefs to be like, that's not like very old school and, and you should take credit for it because it's your restaurant. I'm like, I'm not that insecure that I need to take credit for other people's work. And right. that, you know, that's kind of a gross thing to, to do. I think I think it's my opinion. Um, you know, let these people know they're doing a good job. If, if, if the dish that the customer is talking about is his, he created it and he cooked it. Well, let's give him the props because he deserves it. Well, and I feel like as a, a, I've, you know, been in management or in a, some capacity of a leadership role for a good portion of my career and people who feel appreciated work harder. So if you're giving them the praise and letting them know that the diners are appreciating his creativity, his hard work, his dedication to his craft, honing his craft, um, then he's just going to work harder for you and for himself, which only benefits the restaurant. So that's great. Yeah. I'm curious to know a little bit more, like how long did it take, you know, because it's so unusual what you're doing with a restaurant as far as like changing the, the dishes and the menu so frequently. Um, the only, well, I'm sure there are other restaurants here in town that are similar to that. One that kind of strikes me as probably a staple where people has, it's been successful in doing so is Stone Horse. Now they don't, they don't change the menu like drastically and probably change menu less often now than what they did before. Um, but they were doing that for a while. And it, I felt like I'm curious, how long did it take you to get your diners to like come on this journey with you and it not be such a struggle in saying, okay, I'm sorry. You're disappointed. We don't have that dish tonight. You know, if I had, I, I probably am kind of guessing because I'm sure the front of the house heard it more than I did. I would say probably about, I'm going to say about a year. I think once we hit the year mark and articles have been written about us, um, I think they kind of knew. I mean, we still have people who come in and they're like, oh, you know, like this past week and we had a couple um, newbies come in and they're like, I'm coming next week to get the trout. And I was like, well, I can't tell you if the trout's going to be the same next week. It, we might not even have trout. We'll have something else maybe. And so they're like, oh, okay. Well, maybe I'll come tomorrow. And I was like, well, we're close tomorrow on Sunday. But I think <laughs> for the most part, for the most part, our regular diners, know what it is and and they, and and i think they expect it now like they're very excited and you know sometimes it's just maybe one component of a dish especially in the spring and summer when we're getting so much bounty yeah. from the farmers we'll get stuff and i'm like oh my god this green will look good on the fish or, or it'll complement this sauce um sometimes it's a complete totally different dish different protein has nothing to do with what well, it's replacing um so there's different levels of uh but this last week we actually changed I think I got the on Tuesday night, I texted Trevor and I was like, we're doing five new dishes tomorrow. And then I showed up and I was like, okay, that was a bad idea. Let's do two, <laughs> let's, do the, let's do the two entrees because they're really complicated. And then tomorrow we'll do the three starters. Um, and, you know, we had some people come in with like, oh, I just looked at your menu online, which that's a whole nother, a whole nother thing with people looking at menus online. Um, I'm going to give diners some advice. If you want to look at the restaurants, menu go to the restaurant's website don't google amelinda's menu because right. 
you know, our menu is, we've had hundreds of menus since we opened and we had a lady come in a couple of weeks ago and she sits down and she's like, well, this isn't the menu I saw. And so and she was being fairly rude to the waiter. So he's like, can you just please go talk to her? I was like, just so I go out there and I'm like, you know, what's the issue? And she's like, well, this isn't the menu I saw. And I'm like, well, where did you see the menu? On the internet. And I'm like, okay, well, this doesn't help me. I'm like, where on the internet? Did you Google? She's like, I Googled it. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'm like, I cannot be responsible for old menus people have posted. And people will take pictures of the menu and post it. Sure. Like, if you want, I said, our menu is updated every day at four in the afternoon. So if you're coming in on Wednesday, Wednesday at four in the afternoon, go to our website and look at the menu. So she's like, well, how am I supposed to know that? I'm like, that's what I do. I don't know. I, you know, she, <laughs> I, think she I think she was a lost cause because she walks in, she's like, this isn't what I expected, like from the get go. And, I, and I, I was like, what did you expect? Well, the music's not Spanish. I, this is not what I expected. I was like, okay, uh, cool. I don't, I don't really know what to say. Her husband was very nice. I, well, you know, there's, you know, this, I know this people who've been in the industry for a lengthy period of time know this, um, or should know this. You can't please everyone. And, and everyone has their own, everyone looks through life through their own lens and have their own tastes and their own desires, their own wants. And you, you can, my other favorite one is like, well, this isn't how I had it in Spain. And I'm like, right. well, did you eat it? in this region of Spain or did you eat it in this region of Spain? Because it varies. Uh, was the season the same when you had this versus when you, you know, there's a lot of variables, yeah. Yeah, totally. So, you know, but we have an amazing uh, core set of diners who have been super supportive of us since we opened. Um, and I always like to say that that restaurant was literally a labor of love to open because we had a lot of help from not only um, other chefs in Milwaukee, and I, I want to touch on that in a second, but like friends and family were in there every day helping us build the tables and chairs and, you know, tile the walls. Because we, when we started working on the space, we had $50,000 and that was it. Wow. And uh, the day we opened, and I didn't find this out until several months later, um, my business partner informed me, he's like, the only reason we were able to get food so you could start cooking was because we had credit with these companies. He's like, because we had no money in the bank. Um, but, um, yeah, Milwaukee has been great and, and the diners have been great and, and, and it's, it's been an amazing journey. And again, it was a labor of love to open that restaurant. That's awesome. Okay. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about your nomination. So, um, for those of the listeners that are maybe not so aware of the James Beard awards, um, I think we should start off with James Beard himself just give a little background about that. Um, James Beard was a chef, a mentor, a teacher, a host, a cookbook author, a, um, I mean, a master of culinary. He was Julia Child's best friend. He was Julia Child's best friend. Those two arguably uh, changed the trajectory of culinary arts and, and the, in the way that anyone eats in, in the United States and arguably parts of the world. So and the time that they came onto the scene was, you know, like, I think he was like maybe early 50s. Uh, I know yep. it was in the 50s, 60s, when Americans were starting to eat a lot of processed food and a lot of TV dinners, and that was all the rage. And he was like, no, we need to like cook. Let's Real cook. food. Yeah. And, and cooking isn't hard. So, yes. Yeah. So he was, he, he, you know, he and Julia together changed the trajectory of culinary arts in America. Um, and when he passed away in 1985, shortly after they um, started the James Beard Foundation, uh, the James Beard Foundation Awards started happening, uh, I think started in 1990, the first awards given in 1991. Um, these are like the most prestigious awards culinary wise that you can get in America currently. Correct. I like to compare it, you know, to it's like the Oscars or the Grammys of yeah. the restaurant world. And it's really, it's what it is. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, and you, this isn't the first time you've been nominated, correct? This so, is my third nomination. Oh, Gregory, get it. I was nominated in 2022 and 2023 for Best Chef Midwest. That's fantastic. And then this year you're nominated for, not for your region, but for... I think it's outstanding chef in the field, so it's a national like outstanding chef. This uh, this not, uh, category not only has to do with 
your restaurant and the food and your cooking, but also has a lot to do with what you do for your community. So yeah. we try to do a lot for the community at a moment. Well, so. That was my next question and kind of like plays into that a little bit more. So what does this nomination what does it mean to you, but what does it mean for your community? Like, how does it affect Milwaukee? Um, what What does that mean? All right. Well, you know, I'd say I, every year that I've gotten nominated, I'm always completely surprised by it and, you know, incredibly humbled and, and just like, just really beside myself. And I didn't really expect a, a three years in a row, and especially this category, like I, yeah, if somebody would have told me a month ago, oh, you're going to get nominated for this category, I'm like, you're high and drunk, so I don't know what's wrong with you, because just never, never in a million years. And in fact, I was a, we had had a conversation a couple of weeks ago at the restaurant, because January is usually pretty slow. So I'm talking to my staff, and I was like, I think we're going to have to cut some hours. Maybe you, the wait staff comes in a little bit later. And one of them said, well, the nominations are coming out in a couple of weeks. And I said, we're not getting anything. I'm like, I'm already mentally prepared that we're not getting anything. Three years in a row is kind of a difficult feat. There's a lot of other great chefs in Milwaukee, in the Midwest. Somebody else deserves to be nominated. So let's not count on this. Came home on Tuesday night, went to bed. And I'm laying in bed Wednesday morning, like 8 in the morning. I'm with the dogs. And my phone is just going off. And I was like, that restaurant better be on fire for these people to be texting me this early in the morning. <laughs> and... I don't have my glasses on and I grab the phone and I'm trying and there's all these tags and it's like, what is going on? And then um, I finally opened one from a chef here in Milwaukee. He's a very good friend of mine. And uh, it just said outstanding um, chef. And I was like, outstanding, well, what did I do? And he's like, just go. <laughs> and so it was, I was really surprised. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a very humbling experience. Another really good friend of mine, she's, loves restaurants and she's kind of a chef nerd um she every other day she's texting me names of chefs who have been nominated in this category and i was like you really need to stop doing that because you're starting to freak me out so like nancy silverton was one jose andres has been in this category um mario batali has been in this category so you know i, I wake up every day and i was like it was this a dream i go check the website to make sure my name is still on the list because i still <laughs> like you know, and it's, there's a range of emotions that come with it. Uh, you know, some days I, I'll just like start crying at the restaurant for no reason. Um, and then there's days when I'm just like super stressed about it. But, you know, again, talking about Trevor, he just looks at me, he's like, calm down. He's like, calm down. He's convinced that we're winning. Like in his mind, he's already bought a suit. We're going to Chicago. We got this. Oh, man, so. I really hope that you guys do. I really do. That'd uh, be you know, I would obviously love so the list is there's 20 of us right now and that's how it is for all the categories they narrow the list down april the beginning of april mm -hmm. um, the last two years i've made it to chicago um we'll see this year it's an honor to even make it this far um, right. i would love to i would love to go to chicago just so i could take trevor and i think my dad will be in the country then also so it would be amazing to go with my dad like that. Yes, just, that sounds so beautiful. Share so, that moment with your father. Fingers crossed we make it to Chicago. And if we don't win, that's okay. At least we will recognize it. Um, you know, I think for the, well, the city of Milwaukee has always, I mean, I can't say always, but since I've been here, has always done really well in James Beard nominations. There's actually two, I think there's two, maybe three chefs. No, there's probably four chefs that are either currently cooking in Milwaukee or have retired who have won Best Chef Midwest, I think. So Milwaukee's got a really great culinary scene. Um, but, you know, right now this year, there's six of us from Milwaukee that are nominated in different categories. Um, I think there's four of them or five of them who are Best Chef Midwest and then myself and Outstanding Chef. Um, it's, it, this makes, it puts Milwaukee on the map. Because a lot of people don't think of Milwaukee as being a really good food city. They're like, oh, brats and cheese curds. Great. Um, but we've got <laughs> some really, <laughs> I mean, they're good, but there's only so much of that I can eat. I, I, actually, I'm not a huge fan of them. Um, <laughs> the, the squeakiness freaks me out. Um, <laughs> but we've got some great, great people here. You know, uh, Dan Jacobs and Dan Van Wright, who own Dan Dan and Esther Ebb, they're nominated for Best Chef uh, Midwest. Incredible food. Incredible food. And just really outstanding people um ross and sam who are at odd duck 
that was the restaurant. I ate dinner when I came to visit Milwaukee there. And I was like, okay, Milwaukee actually is serious about food. Um, who else has nominated? Um, Kyle, and I can never remember his, uh, pronounce his last name. He has Birch. That place is insane too. So we're, the, the, the Milwaukee diner is very lucky because um, there's some very talented people here. And one of the things I wanted to talk about earlier that I forgot was there's a, a real sense of community amongst the majority of the chefs and restaurateurs here in Milwaukee, which is something that I had never experienced until I came to Milwaukee. Um, there's a certain amount of healthy competition, but we also all look out for each other and we take care of each other. I think that's why uh, we did much better than other cities during the pandemic as far as restaurants closing. Yeah. Because we were all like looking after each other. Okay, how can I help you make some money? And, and we're going to do this and I'm going to start this program feeding the homeless and you're going to provide me meals and then we're going to pay you a thousand dollars that we're going to raise through uh, grants. And so, I, yeah, I, it's when I first moved here and started meeting all these other chefs and restaurant owners and they're like, well, what do you need? How can we help you open a restaurant? I was like, what do you want? Like, why are you this friendly? But there's something to be said about the Midwest nice. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's it's incredible. We, we, we support each other at any given night of the week. We'll be at each other's restaurants. Um, yeah, it's 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 great. So Milwaukee is very lucky. And I hope and I think Milwaukee realizes that, actually. That's awesome. Milwaukee is really good at supporting the small, independently owned restaurants. It sounds like you're I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you Milwaukee's home now, Greg. Well, eh, um, I hate winter. I hate winter. I feel like if I would have come to visit in the winter, I probably would not be having this conversation with you. Um, <laughs> I've been here for 12 years. It, this year will be my 12th year. I love it. Um, I've made some amazing friends. So for the time being, it's home. You know, I'm um, yeah. will be 10 next year. Um, and then we'll see what happens after that. Yeah, that's awesome. But, okay. You know, Go, real quick, going back to like talking about how supportive the community is of the restaurants here. Um, during the pandemic, when the first set of um, stimulus checks went out, we had customers or regulars send us their stimulus checks <gasps> and, be, and be like, here, we don't need this. We want to make sure the restaurant survives. So you just use this to keep the restaurant open, which was, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite, I was quite taken back and, and, yeah, that's Greg. I mean, I don't I don't know of anybody that has had that happen to. I mean, maybe they did, but I don't know of it. That's it was pretty incredible. That... And it's funny because I will talk to tables and they'll be, you know, I'll make like a joke or a passing comment about like after 10 years, I'm shutting down and they just get visibly upset. Why? I'm like, well, I, don't, I don't really want to work so tay till I'm 80 and uh I don't know, like my back, and it's too cold here sometimes. So, right. You know, but there, a lot of people feel like they own part of the restaurant, actually. That is really awesome. It's great. It's great. It's great. I mean, I have not eaten at your restaurant, but it sounds like you have not only fed these people obviously delicious food, otherwise they wouldn't keep coming back. But you've 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 made some sort of positive impact on that community. You know, we, when we, when we, when I opened the restaurant, I made a very clear decision that not only was it going to be a space to feed people, but we wanted to try to use it to elevate other people in the community and the industry and to use it to kind of make our community better. So, you know, we, if it wasn't because Nell, who used to own the National Cafe, allowed me to do my pop up at, at, at her place, I don't know if I'm Melinda would have ever opened. So the first thing we did was like, okay, we're going to host other chefs and restaurateurs, they can come here, do pop-ups, get their foot in the door, get their name out there. So we've done a bunch of those. And then the two programs that I'm super proud of that we've started since we've been open, and these were both, uh, one was in 2018 or 2019, and that one's called Tables Across Borders. And uh, we were one of the first restaurants to participate in. My friend Kai, who worked with refugees here in Milwaukee, came to me and said, I wanna help refugees. Would you mind letting them come and use your restaurant? We'll do a dinner. We'll raise some money. So the way it works is uh, we invite refugees who have just settled to Milwaukee to come to Amalinda and prepare the food of their homeland. Uh -huh. um, we sell tickets, and then 100% of the ticket 
proceeds goes to them. So we see nothing. Uh, my staff volunteers, so they don't get paid for the evening. And it's a good way for them to get some money in their pocket and buy those essential things they need once they get here. Um, and it's fun for us in the restaurant because we get to see how they're cooking and what their cuisine is like. And then the customers get to try a new food. So we are about to start the 2024 session and we have our first one in a couple of weeks and it's going to be Burmese food. So I'm super excited about wow. so that, that program. I really love. And then the second one was during the pandemic, my friend, Karen, who was a pastor, she's now retired. She came to me one day and she said, we're going to help um, you guys stay open. And so this is what I want to do. We're, I'm going to raise a bunch of money. I need you to find nine other restaurants, include on Melinda, and we're going to feed the homeless. And this was probably like about two months into the pandemic. And I looked at her and I was like, Karen, I don't have the bandwidth for this. I'm barely keeping this place open. And she's like, no, we're going to do it. I was like, okay, <laughs> fine. So she raised, I think we ended up giving out by the time the program ended. And so basically what the program was every Saturday, three restaurants. So we had a roster of 10 and one of them was on Melinda. Three restaurants would provide us a hundred meals and to go containers. And then Hungry Hearts, which is the name of the program, would pay the restaurants $1,000. And then those meals were distributed amongst the community, people who had lost their jobs or people who were homeless. Um, and we did that until I think October of 2022, maybe. Wow. Or maybe, or maybe it was, maybe it was spring of 2023. It's all a blur. So I think the other day I was looking at some numbers and I think we ended up handing out about 50,000 meals. Wow. Time, and we raised or gave to restaurants. I think it was close to $500,000. So, wow. And that, the restaurants were able to stay up and keep their staff, you know. So those are two of the things that we've done that, that I'm really proud of that have made a change in our, in our community. But, you know, I'm in a position where I can help other people. So I don't see why I wouldn't. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, what do you think, like, I mean, all of those things that you just said, I feel like would be the perfect answer to this, but I'm curious if there's anything more, like you're not done. What is the culinary imprint that you hope to leave? I don't know if it's like a culinary imprint as far as like food wise, but I think I would like for people 30 years from now to be like, oh, remember that restaurant on Melinda? Not only did they serve good food, but they did really great things for the community. Um, yeah. And their staff went off to do really good things. You know, I have, I look at some of the people that have worked for us, especially in the kitchen, and I'm just like blown away where they are. You know, I have a sous chef now who was executive chef of a newly opened restaurant. I have another sous chef who's about to go be, go the sous, be the sous chef at another super busy, very fancy big restaurant. Um, so I'm proud of, of the people that have worked at Amalinda and have gone on to do great things. So that's, that's what I hope our imprint is, is that not only did we serve great food and made people happy for an hour and a half while they were sitting there, but that we were able to change our community and elevate people who work for us. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. I love that answer. Um, so you were talking about how much you hate the weather in the winter time. You know, Tulsa doesn't get a lot of snow or get real well, cold. You know, you and my aunt, it's like the two of you are talking to each other because every time I go home for Thanksgiving, she's like, you know, when are you moving back? And I, I you know, in all honesty, I do struggle with that. You know, we're all getting older. Um, my nieces and nephews are getting older. Um, you know, I have a very tight relationship with my brothers. And although we talk almost every day or every other day, you know, we're not, we don't see each other that often. Right. What I've told people that if I were to ever leave Milwaukee, and I'm not saying that I am, so everybody calm down. I'm Linda's still open. Um, <laughs> if I'm not leaving the country, I would go back to Oklahoma. Really? Be oh, there's a chance. Just, well, I mean, it's a very slim chance, but I would go back to Oklahoma. Because... <laughs> The last two years I've gone to visit Mexico City and I am in love with Mexico City and it's so warm and I they have no snow and it would be amazing. So Yes. If you if you guys ever want to take a trip outside of the country, I highly recommend Mexico City. Well, you move to Mexico City, I'm definitely gonna come see you there for sure. Perfect. And I mean <laughs> we're I'm talking in another 10, 15 years. Right. Right. Okay. So I feel like we did a really good job of covering um everything about you and the restaurant and all of the amazing things that you've accomplished. I would like to move on now to your pro tip. Okay. Like, oh, my pro tip. I forgot. Mm -hmm. pro tip. I'm sure I've got one. Let me think about this. Okay. I got one. 
So when you're going to make creme brulees or custards and you, you know, you pour the liquid, the custard base into the ramekins, you'll get little bubbles. Yeah. In order to get a, a, a perfectly shiny surface, grab your torch that you use to brulee the creme brulees and just quickly pass it over the liquid and it makes all the little bubbles pop. That, so that's my you know, I never thought about that as far as creme brulee, but you see people do that all the time in art with resin. So when they go and they pour resin out, they'll torch it to get the bubble salt to come out. So I would have never thought about, you know, using that technique for- Pro tip is also when you're cooking stuff in a water bath, put a cloth napkin, then add your ramekins and then add the water and the cloth napkin will keep them from moving around. So there you go. Those are great pro tips. Fantastic. Okay, um, now I would love to hear what your question will be for our next guest. Let me think about this for a second. Uh, I would say... And all I can give you, like, as far as, like, a hint... It, do they, they work in restaurants, right? Yeah. They're, okay. well, they'll, they'll be in the industry at in some capacity. I do have a... Got one. And this okay. one this one might be controversial, so I'm, I'm excited to no, watch the better. next episode. In their opinion, who has... The superior barbecue sauce. Oh, North Carolina, yes. South Carolina, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas City, Missouri. Who has the best and why? Why do they think that is the best barbecue sauce? I love that. I love oh. that. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, sir, I, I have adored getting the opportunity to catch back up with you. And I am so honored to call you my friend. I'm so proud of all of the work that you've accomplished in Milwaukee, even though I'm not reaping any of the benefits from it. I am still very proud of you and very proud to call you my friend. Um, and I am so rooting for you and your restaurant. And Fingers crossed. Yes, I think, I think you, hearing more about what you've been doing and what you've accomplished, I think you really, really have a shot at winning this. All right, well. Yeah. From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> uh, thank you for inviting me to come and chat with you guys. Um, no, it's been you. awesome. You know, I thank you. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, when I come back to town next, I will make sure that we see each other. No, I would love that. I would love to go to lunch or coffee or anything. It doesn't have to be anything big. No, no, we'll go out and have we'll go out and have a meal, and then you guys need to come up to Milwaukee. But come in the summer. <laughs> They'll come in the winter, please. <laughs> okay, deal. Thank right. you so much for having me. Thank you. Bon voyage. Bon voyage.